bill is supposed to talk about if a person gets elected, and they don't have trial uh, judges, they don't have experiences of, of being in court over trials, then they're supposed to have education and assistance uh, to help you gain those or find those experiences. And they're going to require you to have some uh, what we call uh, training and so many hours uh, per year. Lawyers have to do that right now. To be an attorney, you have to have so many hours per year. And if you don't get them, and you don't get them, they give you a little grace period. Say, if you, you have that, you, you can continue to give an education in. And they give you, you got to estimate a month to get it in. If you don't get it in, you don't get a Thank you. 
judges here today. I want to say thank y'all for coming. Thank you for coming. But we want to be able to have that dialogue. So if anybody else could kind of explain that right here. Right. And you can introduce yourself and tell us yeah. who you are. Um, I'm Judge Johnson, and I preside over the 309 Assembly District. So I'm happy in the community. I'm not a professional. I am tired because I started my job at 7.30 in the morning, and I work, 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 and I work in the family court, so it's very emotional. And so we understand that we need to be present in the community during times when we're not running the site. But when Judge Davis is saying it takes a village, we, like I said, we're here because we believe what you say. But what we do need, the village is going to consist of you also telling us. With me being here, and you hearing me here, and then you go tell people that the judges do come out when they're not right. They do care. They do listen. So it takes me, it takes you, and it takes the other people that you can touch. It's, it's, it's always not taking the village and the African American community. All the way back from slavery to today. What has happened is somehow our village have been infiltrated yes. and scattered. Yes. And so we're trying to bring it back together. And we need you to help us do that. Um, before when I ran, like the first time I was running, I was everywhere. All up everywhere. You know why? Because I didn't have this job. So having this job adds extra responsibility. Even though I know I have to continue to do what I did to come out and touch people and let them know that what they entrusted me to do that I am doing for them. So we we understand and I hear you and I think uh, Judge Davis was saying what I, I'm saying too, but sometimes our delivery is different. But we understand what you're saying. Well, you also have a code of ethics that you can't come out and just, uh, because of your canons, uh, judicial canons, you just can't come out and just, you can't have to get that everywhere. It is not for you. That's correct. Well, and I yeah. also because was kind of directing my comment to you. If you just have to just finish the panel, you're correct. Just give that, that courtesy. Uh, Texas has a canons of ethics that have judges on the eight, seven rules, and they just can't go away. And be our campaign on this or something sex. And and you and being a black Jew, you have to be careful to make sure that you follow those guidelines because you don't want to find the next thing you know, probably some kind of ethics complaint against you. Go ahead, right here. Well my 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 comment was more so like directly it wasn't at judges and it was more so directly to your group of people as far as why we're not coming out the road. But like I also get a lot of heat in these rooms because I am here and I do show up. So telling me that you're tired and all that stuff, I've been at work too. I'm a community organizer. I do it when I wake up and when I go to sleep, so I understand being tired, but I don't get to be tired if y'all want to if y'all want me to be a part of the village. So what I get is a lot of heat when really we should be like taking in what I'm saying because it's, it's a gift. It, it's like, okay, this is what people really think and it's more really basic. Like, we want to see Sophonia come into our stuff. We want to see Harold Dunn come to our stuff. We want to see um, Tasha Jackson come to our stuff and not just talk to the representatives in their office. So I'm like, not almost not even talking to the judge, so to speak, but more so to like the representatives that we see that, you know, are the the mark that could say, you know, so that's what I was speaking to. And so I wouldn't try to be group, but thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Actually, what was happening is you were in the group because I specifically said that we're here, we need help. It takes a real But I'm here to help, so, so, so I don't be trying to hear that. Yeah. So that's redundant. Like, it's redundant. They've been here to try to educate each other so we can work together. And I would love for you guys to, to meet out if you want to further that dialogue because we have other things we need to talk about today. This is one of the precinct chairs. For those of you who don't, don't know who the young lady is, she's one of the newly uh, appointed precinct chairs. A lot of people have
have jobs. A lot of people are going to have a precinct. Precinct here. Well, she wants to know your name. My name is Courtney Rose. My precinct is 150. Hold on with the water. Um, and where is your precinct? 150, like uh, Tidwell and Mesa area. And what's the name of the, the community? My subdivision is Bernie Ford. Bernie Ford, okay. A lot of you who have never been included may seem like they're, they're kind of confrontational, but that's the frustration of them thinking it's them against us. There is no them against us. They call us the older. It's not the older or the younger. We all got to work together. We're getting whooped at the polls. These judges are here, and I want them to introduce themselves. Yes. A lot of people don't know, know a judge is here judge until they are in a black robe up on that bench. These ladies are showing you, and we care. This representative is showing you, we care, we're here. You don't see the others come out. You don't say anything about the others that don't come out, but you want to beat up ours when they come. And what I want to try to do, Debbie Allen, I want us to learn to how to talk to each other, because if I did not look like you, you wouldn't talk to me like that. So all I'm asking is for some respect to each other. Let's learn to talk to I can disagree with you. Don't even have to like you, but disagree. But I don't have to be you know, antagonist. Okay? So what I'm going to do is have Fred come up. There you go. And Fred is going to ask all of the judges who took the time and elected officials to come out and introduce themselves. And then we'll hear from the state rep once again. Again, I did not know I was on program right now. <laughs> I gave him the duty, and I will be respectful and carry through with my duty. But the first duty I was given was to introduce this young lady to my left. This is Miss Jackie Mayborn, uh, previous Super Mayor of the President, uh, Super Mayor of East New York Homestead Number 47, as well as the Super Mayor of the Alliance President. Yes. Super Mayor of the Alliance yes. President. And the current coordinator of Super Neighborhoods, uh, Northeast Super Neighborhoods United. And if there are any additional titles, you'll have to forgive me for not knowing them by heart, because I'm not reading anything. Let's give her a round of applause for coming out.
our honorables in front of the Congress and about this bill, but uh, how it affects you uh, and, and uh, what we can do to, to, uh, to support. So just introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lori Chambers Gray, and I am judge of the 262nd Criminal District Court. Um, I ran and uh, was elected in 2018 along with uh, 17 other African American females. And I'm happy to see my fellow judges here tonight. Um, this is where it actually all began for me. I closed a very successful practice after 29 years because I understood that there was problems in our community and I couldn't point the finger at somebody else. I had to look at myself to see what can I do to do that. And I do thank the young um, lady that's here tonight. I'm sorry I didn't get Courtney McGarry and Courtney. But I can hear you and I just want to assure you that we all have put down a lot of things and made you and our community our priority. That's why we're here tonight. So I want to thank you for having this discussion tonight. I look forward to talking to other people. I don't want to go on too much, but I do want to say we are stronger together. And we are getting things done.
You train your board in just one way? Absolutely. You mean in terms of to be a judge or what? A judge or as far as your career, whatever. Or vote, vote, or, or vote or whatever. Or whatever. It's good to be trained more than just one way, right? Absolutely. I mean, knowledge, as they say, is power. So as much as you know, you can learn about a specific topic, uh, an area of the law. That's why I'm so honored to serve beside Judge Davis and Judge Johnson and all these judges who are serving in this county because we work ourselves just to be able to get through law school, to get out, build practices, and then get on the ground in a, in a massive county like this and be able to talk to people and then serve with dignity. Because you're not hearing where we are being reversed every day. You're not hearing where we have done something to dishonor our community. You're not hearing that because it's not there. And I will tell you, if it was there, that would be the first thing that they would say. But I remember we did an interview right before we took office, and there was a reporter from the news organization. And she looked at us and she said, well, what's going to happen on day one as if we were just pretending to be? And I looked at her and I said, ma'am, we are lawyers. I mean, we are elected judges, but we are tried and proven lawyers. So we know what the court room looks like, and we know what to do when we do it.
My name is Ursula Hall, and I am judge of the 165th Civil District Court. I was 11 years a municipal judge of the city of Houston, and seven years on this bench hoping to be reelected. And why don't you tell me you have red bone on this side of the <laughs> <laughs> My people hail from Trinity Gardens. <laughs> <laughs>
And then from the juvenile court, they, they might end up in a misdemeanor court to a felony court to the TDC. So you heard about the pipeline of Yes. The family courts, nobody will think about it. We're part of that pipeline. Mm. Oh. And, okay. and so my job is to make sure that I minimize the people who continue through that pipeline. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, when you, when you talk about child support enforcement, because we do the child support enforcement, um, you have probably equally African American and Hispanic. When you um, talk about the lowest rates, it's pretty much equal across the races, but we're seeing a lot more um, like Asians or uh, uh, South Pacific, uh, South Pacific Islanders. Those people are coming into the um, court system for divorces and those things that they normally, within their culture, uh, kept at a minimum. They, was, they were strong, you know, strongly um, in favor of families and the, uh, parents going through together to raise the children. But we see that um, we see a lot of mental health issues too mm -hmm. um, coming through our, our courts. It's a lot of stress on people. There's a lot of stress. A lot of stress on people. How do they measure the effectiveness of the court? Who's name? Okay. Okay. Just so, in general. So we heard from the other okay. judge about the clearance rate. Mm -hmm. um, the things same. like that being made publicly available. Okay. Um, so what is it for family courts? I must say, I can speak to 309. <laughs> 309 has been number one since day one. <laughs> and moving my cases. And also, we were um, the Supreme Court of Texas. They have a Texas Children Commission where they selected six courts throughout Texas to be what we call a trauma informed court. And my court was selected as one of those. And that's um, how I treat families when they come before me. People involved in CPS cases, where we try to look at the whole family and the trauma that that parent may have experienced the trauma that the children may be experiencing, the generational trauma, and looking at those people and saying, how can we heal this family by the, providing them resources to keep this child in, in that family? Because, because the statistics show that children who have been involved in the CPS system, they have negative, they, they call them positive outcomes because they may get adopted, but in the long run, they have negative outcomes because a large percentage of them end up in TCC or end up homeless. If we can keep them safe and their families with their connections, that will be a most productive and positive outcome for the community at large and for that child. May I? Maybe before I, I'm going to come back to you. I'll, I'll see you. Uh, one of the things I, that I, I'm glad Fred is that we're just now becoming more aware of trauma and the death of trauma, how deep it is ingrained in the individual and in children. And that's another area that we're going to have to spend a lot of money in in the mental health area in order to be able to treat and help these persons overcome those areas. Dr. Davis? I wanted to commend the judges because yes. I my son. Commend. Thank How you. lovely. Yeah. <laughs> we don't hear that. We don't hear no, that. My son, was, my son was in one of those situations with his children. COVID, you know, COVID took a big part on people with the money. And his baby's mama took them from him, thinking that, you know, she's going to get child support from him, which he's had them all the time. And it was really, it took a really big toll on him and the children. And I said, I do, because whatever judge, whoever it was, listened to him, got the paperwork together for him and from him, because my address was on all the paperwork. And he was going through a lot. You'd have to really see him mentally, what he was going through. And when the judge told him, Mr., I see your paperwork, I see what you've done. We want to get you back with your children. Because they had to see the children and had saw the pictures where they had lost so much weight they were just so depressed. 
And when he got that done, and I do say, I thank you. I truly do. They're with him now, looking much better. But I know that Judge Deidre, you have a session that you bring the children in. Yeah. Judge Franklin, you have that too because you all came to our church one time for our youth on Black History. And they were there. But I say, how can they get into the system to know that this judge, she's just like you, but she wants to see you do better. Do you have those programs so that I will know to take my grandson there? Oh, please, bring her Yes, please. The 270th, I don't know if this is all, but we welcome you. Um, I have several uh, things that I do. One is I do an honorary judge of the day, and I am the one who had over a thousand young people come by the court the first year before COVID shut us down, but now we're starting to open up a little bit more and have them coming in. Scout troops, Girl Scout troops, classrooms, individuals, all you have to do is contact me and you're welcome to come and I'll do a whole little ceremony for them. They can have on YouTube with them doing their uh, honorary judge of the day. They can have it Facebook. I will give you a recording of it. We have the uh, all on all the screens in the courtroom, the big ones, so you can snap pictures of them. And I'll give them a certificate, honorary judge of the day, so they can take it to school for show and tell, or, you know, depending on how old they are. And I didn't realize how important that certificate was. They <laughs> love that certificate. I left the camera on or recorder on. I left the room. One of my friends I had her little ne uh, nephew from the UK. So I made sure he took pictures near the American flag and the Texas flag and, you know, everything. But when I, I left the room to go get something, um, he was in the camera. And I didn't find out till later when I watched it. But he was seven, and he's like, I am a judge. I have a certificate. And, and this is a British accent, by the way. Uh, you know. uh, but he's like, I have a certificate. And I was like, he's seven. He, you know, whatever. But it, it does um, encourage them. And the thing that I like is I believe in seeing yourself. You need to see yourself in these roles. You need to see yourself in these positions. And when their parents or scout leaders or teachers are taking pictures of them sitting on the bench, hitting the gavel, they do the, what's that thing that they do when they, <coughs> young people, young person, <laughs> what is it that they do? Oh, yeah. What is boomerang? Yeah, oh my God, they love the boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> so they, want, they want the boomerang of them giving their order. I have the microphone on, so it's out in the court. And so they have all these a memories of them in a special moment in a powerful position so that if by chance in the future they get a little off course as we often do, their mommy, their dad, or somebody can show them the picture of them in that powerful position. They can show them the recording of that silly boomerang. Show them the YouTube video, which is there forever. Show them the Facebook recording. And that's what's so important. And the other thing that I love doing when, when they come visit before they leave, because the same way you're looking at us right here, they would be sitting in the audience and looking. Well, I'm saying, okay, well, they see that I'm real, they see that I'm them. But then it occurred to me, I'm not having a direct connection. So when, what I do is I'll go to the back before they say goodbye, and I make sure and shake each one of their hands and look them in the eyes and thank them for coming to visit me at the court and being one of my judges or one of the students that come. And I'm hoping we're transferring energy. They're saying that I really care because sometimes I'm crying like a crazy person because you know, when you see their little faces, it does move you. And when they write letters back and they say, I've never been on the elevator, I've never been, hey, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you don't realize how much you're impacting people. So that's kind of off topic of what we do in the civil court, but I think somehow we got there. But because I have the program for it. Yes, yes, that's out. Go ahead. Let me, let me just say something. I'm glad that you know about the mock shot. Um, we do a mock shot every Mindful just Mark Trump. And I too, one of the things I wanted to do was be proactive with our 
kids and let them understand they're the head and not the tail, and that we, we don't just belong in the orange jumpsuit. And so what the mock trial does is it's, it's, um, we train them as us to be prosecutors and defense attorneys. I have judges that, a couple of the judges up here have uh, volunteer. Um, they judge the round, and then we have attorneys that come in. Uh, attorney Robert Rogers has been important. Some of the um, volunteers have come in to train the kids how to do prosecutor uh, opening statements and closing arguments, and they actually get a case. And they are the attorneys and the prosecutors. They switch sides and compete. And so each year we have that, and um, really excited about that. The kids are really, really excited. In fact, we have two kids that are now in law school that are headed to law school. Because they are in the program. Yeah.
Congratulations. That's impressive. I cannot put that on a bulletin board. I cannot put it on my court website. 
I will hook you up if I can and try to make sure the taker will listen to you. But it is what happens in countless courts all the time. So that's a plug for my colleagues. <laughs> just for taking that posture. Do you have any data at this point on the success rate for? I don't, but I, I want to bring a candidate in. And interestingly, a, a candidate that I don't know personally, but she was in court last week. And you have that exact situation. The homeowner didn't show up. I don't know her personally. I know she's a candidate. I would have done it whether she was a candidate or not. I said, Ms. Crawford, would you consider postponing this hearing until next week? So we could try again to get in touch with the homeowner? What? And she said yes. It was just simple. And she's probably going to talk to her client and you know, I know what, how they approach. But the answer to your question is no, I do not. But this election season, where I think we have been filled with so much hatred and misinformation, has made me say, I'm going to try to find a way to record those kinds of events. I don't know how to do it yet, but I am going to try. I do not have any stats on it. Yeah. She's been in my court more than a few times and she was there this week, an exact same thing. Uh, because sometimes she, they will get uh, this property. Sometimes Uh, for example, today, I had a docket 19 new cases, 
Not to mention, I probably have about 50 cases on my dock. 19, in addition to the 50, were new, okay? So that's 69. This is just today. Now, we played out maybe about six cases. Six cases. Now, when I say we played out, again, the judge has nothing to do with that. That's the prosecutor and the defense attorney. They get together and they make a determination if they want to come up with an agreement, you know, where their client decides that they want to take the plea from the state, and they make that determination, okay, they don't want to take the trial, they want to plea, okay? Six cases that we play out. So I'm already at 19, so I'm already, six cases, I'm, I'm what? Plus 16, right? Plus 13, that I did not plead out, but those are brand new cases on top of the 50 that we already had. That's just today. Now tomorrow, I'll have brand new cases. But let me also mention, in addition to that, I have added 13 new cases that came to me because there was a gentleman who was in my court who was on probation. He picked up another case. And so what happens is all those cases are tracked to my court because he's on probation. So that's 13 other defendants will now come into my court on my dock. Okay? And so when you think about it, it's like, wow, it looks like she has a lot of doctors. She's not moving cases. It's not incumbent upon the judge, right? And I can't make someone plead. That's not my job. You're in control when the crimes are committed. Exactly. <laughs> That's not my job. My job is to make sure that everyone that comes before this court, that they get a fair process. It takes process. time. And it takes time. Because exactly. they spent them through and didn't talk to them. Exactly. And then there are times when cases are longer, they've been on the docket for a long period of time because we're waiting for DNA. We're waiting for um, ballistics report. And right now, I think, Judge Gray, how long is it for waiting on that? Oh, months. Months. And, months. And, I, I have some cases that's up to years. Yes. So let's mm -hmm. just understand this all a smoke screen, and they're trying to have this other information about people that look like you and I. That's not correct. Yes, sir. I got tired of seeing the same judge. I'm going to miss up. He'll feel like going to see the same judge. Yes. And I got tired of seeing the same man. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I always tell people, don't come back. When they clean out, don't come back. They say, Judge Franklin, I won't be back. And I say, y'all say it all the time, but then I see you back. Don't come back. Why wouldn't we have a district attorney that the meeting? Now, this is for judges only. Oh, I, I learned this. Yeah. Judges, right. my, my judges only that I want to hear from. I want to make sure everybody understands what Judge Franklin just explained. Normally what we hear is this judge is not doing her job. Mm -hmm. She's not doing her cases. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted these judges to come out so that you can hear from them, not from me, not from what I said he said. Because by the time it gets from me to you to you, mm -hmm. it's all messed up. Mm -hmm. All we ever hear is that these judges are not doing their job. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked earlier about caseloads yes. and statistics. Yes. So just what she just shared with us, nobody has ever told us that. That not only do you have the docket of the day, but you also have a ton of other cases coming out, and then you gotta wait on all this other stuff. But all they ever tell us voters, this certain judge is not doing her job. Wow. She's backed up. Wow. You, you know, so I'm so thankful y'all are here so we can hear from you, yes. Layla. Yes. What is actually happening in your court? Because what we're hearing out here in the streets yes. is that y'all are doing your job. And I know that can't be true. And then that's the other thing, too. I, I would tell, it's, it's been very, very interesting in how all of a sudden now the docket numbers are so important, mm. right? Mm. Because I remember when I was elected in 2016, we didn't have the diversity on, on, our, on our bench, okay? In fact, you didn't even hear a judge's name, I mean, in the news. No, I mean, nor did you even see a picture. You didn't see a picture of us. Right. You didn't hear about a docket number. Nothing. It didn't become a problem until the judiciary began to start being reflective of our community. Ooh, That's yes, when it started yes. becoming a problem. That's when it started becoming an issue. And the misinformation started getting out. Yes. Because like I said, they have sent information on the news talking about one of my other colleagues and their names, which you put our face on it. Now yes. you tell me why, why is that? And I'm not making this up. Same mm -hmm. way they show white faces when it's the defendant. Exactly. Or the exactly. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we're in Black History Month. We're in Black and, History Month. And mm -hmm. one of the things that tends to happen 
For those of us who know our history, we're always stated as we're lazy. Mm -hmm. And we yes. know that we yes. can talk, that we have to be 10 times more than our colleagues. We yes. understand that. And so, you know, that, that's, like I said, it's a small screen, and we need to understand the misinformation. And I'm so glad, Ms. D, for having this to give us the, the opportunity to be able to explain to the community so that they understand that we are doing our job. Yes. We, like, like, like Judge um, Bates said, this is a ministry. This is a calling. And so, um, you know, I, I know most of us, if not all of us, we're, we're, we're women of God. And so I, my, my thing is I owe whatever I do has to be done before him. So it's not about man, right? It's about a calling that you've been done. And so, you know, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, you will be held accountable. That's right. And what you all do won't, won't, I mean, won't, um, has nothing to do with what he will do. That's right. So, yeah. um, that's it. That's it. That's it. so our original assignment was to talk about the legislation that got us to this place. So we will hear from Ms. T, longtime family friend who arrived at the legislature with my dad long ago. But what I want to tell you on the civil side is this. It is absolutely positively true that the only metric ever used to measure judges, you can go to the Supreme Court's website today, and you'll see two things. Backlog and clearance rate. Those two things were never published. Legislation was passed last year that demands all of the divisions, all the types of courts publish it, but previously it was only criminal. You have to ask yourself why they want that to go public. And I can tell you by personal observation, the average clearance rate when others were on the bench was significantly lower. I'm talking forty yeah. percent. So it was not historically important. And though I have nothing to hide, because for two years I was the worst, and for five I was among the best, I'm not ashamed of that, that is my truth. Um, I don't have a backlog. When my opponent goes out in public and says every day, I promise here that I do. I'm okay with that, because I can't control other people's dishonesty. But we have to recognize how we're being measured determines what happens to us. And that measure was dictated by someone else because it is simply how many cases in in one year and how many out. It doesn't account for the repeat offender, it doesn't account for the missing evidence. In civil courts, it doesn't account for the people who asked for continuance because they got COVID. These things are not reflected. So even, we certainly need measures. That's the way society is operating now. Everybody wants a metric and a brand and a, a data point. I have strong feelings about that, but okay, I can accept that. But when you decide what they are, make them fair. Make them fair and acknowledge that they were historically worse than they are now. We are more productive as Democrats with predominantly African Americans on the bench than the bench was 15 years ago. It's statistically true, and it did not matter until now. Thank you to every judge here. 
here, I will say this. I'm in the, the, the fight of the life, and I think about you all the day. You guys have walked, so I can try to stay off running. And you guys have made this round, so I can at least go knock on doors and feel welcome. My name is Lillian Kenny Alexander, and I'm running for the 507 Family Court. There are 11 family courts, and this is one of them that's up for re-election. You'll be on your ballot. I practice family law now. I've been practicing family law for 12 years. I'm a Delta from LSU, and I am a graduate of Texas Southern University, TSU. I started, meet, I started um, working in the TSU clinic, actually, with um, Professor Harmon, who actually was a dear mentor of mine, and that's when I knew I was ready to serve. So it is time to serve. This family court is time for a change, and I'm ready to bring that change. So with that being said, I'll be on your ballot, Lillian Alexander, Lillian Alexander, Lillian Alexander. Thank you. So when I see so many African-American female 
Judiciary candidates. It's just a great gratitude of you two for paying that way on over on that 8th of 2016. My former intern. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. In high school with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I want to say to you, particularly the constituents here, is that I mean, this is a most need of you guys to get informed in this election. This is not a typical election. As the candidates alluded to, this information is critical. And we want to make sure that we select the very best. We're not saying we should select judges that look like us. It's a myth. Um, I try to get the calculation on the number of CPA candidates. They have over 275 legal spirits together. Again, when I say that 13 judiciary candidates, again, as some of the participants, the constituents know, these city judges, these judges are in you guys' community as well, too. And not just city judges, you have candidates right here with you, that you want to see right here. I want to tell you a little bit more about their platform. But I want you to understand here today, I want you to tell me, tell the church, church women that we have so many African American women running for judiciary spots. But I want you to understand that at the end of the day, that you have to know, again, who you are. Again, a lot of work will come with you if you do not tell your story. So I'm telling you now, they need your support. Please support me. Good evening, everyone. I am Takasha Francis, your candidate for the 152nd Civil District Court. I'm actually going to cut my talking points down because I think we belabored the issues around what is happening in the streets. And let me just kind of bring it down concisely. When you look at a judge, there are two things that are paramount to truth. One, as lawyers, we have ethical responsibilities to be above reproach and ethical in our dealings with one another. As judges, you are on the level of God, which means that if you're a lawyer, you have to have a certain level of, when you are a judge, that is a higher level of credibility. And we already know at this point that there are at least three black women who are extremely awful and say we're overly qualified. The oil positions that we are running for who have been challenged by white incumbents who have decided that it is their definition of either practicing law, appropriate applications, or looking at our credibility. The truth stands for something. And what I believe is a lie ain't nothing for nobody to tell, and the truth don't need no help. So the next time someone says to you, well, I heard Takasha Francis, and I am currently the only black woman who is still in active litigation where my eligibility is being challenged. And what I want to bring out to you in what separates me from uh, the incumbent, who is Robert Schaefer, Robert Schaefer, Robert Schaefer. No, it's not, I'll put it out there. Okay. So I'm telling you that because I want you, because I want the other name there is the one that you should be voting for. When a sitting judge will literally file a frivolous lawsuit to cast aspersions on a qualified candidate so that they can secure an uncontested victory, that is not only wasting of judicial resources, frivolous lawsuits, but it is also indicative of his character, or let me just say his lack of character. <laughs> Anyone who would do that cannot be trusted. If you do that to a colleague, what then will you do to litigants who come in front of you who are the fairness, the equity, and the impartiality that they are deserving of? So remember when you vote for the 152nd, Takasha Francis, Takasha Francis, Takasha Francis. When it comes to justice, don't take any chances. Vote for Takasha Francis. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, and now we've done about 15,000 of them wow. since 2007. Also, Johnny Holmes only kept 12 prosecutors, 12 black prosecutors. The, if one left, they would count it. And we would have to uh, meet in secret in the beer parade downtown in the East. Talk about me. I'll talk about all the people before you. Glenn Hill. We all met down at <coughs> Mark Benton. We all had to meet and talk because they couldn't see us talking again. That was the days that I was there. And I've been through all of that. So Kim Rock was a person who ran for 40 years. And although she did a lot of bad press, she's allowed me to write these programs. There were 11,000 juveniles in juvenile detention when we got there. It's 2,900 now. I want y'all to know that. We don't talk about that a lot. We've written programs where if they get in trouble in, in the third ward area, like the Yates and Cohen, they go to Hopeful Families. The DA's office is paying 285,000 a year for social workers. And that's a program I also work. For them to go to Dr. Cofield's program. And on the north side, it's called the uh, Fifth Ward Development Center, and that's cut for families. Uh, we did that for two years <coughs> ago. But I'm just saying, you know, we've been doing some real important things so our children do not go to jail, and some of the administrative processes are happening at school. Like when we had fights, I'm 65, so when we had fights, we went to the principal's office, went home for three days. You didn't go to jail, they didn't put handcuffs on them right. like they do now. So we, We've changed that paradigm. We don't even file juvenile cases for misdemeanors. Only felonies. So I'm just saying, a lot of things have ch changed in the last few years. The public doesn't hear anything about it. But it's been going on since we've been there. So I just want you to know those kind of changes that were made there, if I'm elected to judge, those same changes will continue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just want to say something. She's not with yeah. the I was in jail every Sunday. 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 We have a workshop right here in this room talking about what you need to do and get a probate. All right. Do you need a will? Do you need a living will? Do you need a power of attorney? Do you know how to pass what you do have without having your parent and Lord write it out in probate? Mm -hmm. yeah. We're going to have some idea and talk about those things in this room at 10 a.m. Saturday.
have a lot of people, when you leave here tonight, just don't leave here worried about the vote for yourself. Leave here thinking about you. This campus still we want to be the largest campus at HCC. And the reason we're going to be the largest campus is because the neighborhood makes the campus. But we need your support in sending people here. We have all kinds of real going on. We're number one. We don't know. Now, I, love, I love the little pipes in here. <laughs> I love <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, the little I'm sorry. Yeah, talk the little talk. The ladies show you the If I may, if I may, I, I want to give the statistic that I, I heard. Uh, campus enrollment at this campus has increased 86%. Yes. 